What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Believe in Chargers. I'm your host, Borna Nazari, alongside Lorenzo Neal. Lorenzo, tell us a little bit about our special guest today, my man. No question, Borna. I would absolutely love to. He's a definitely special. He's half crazy and all stupid. I absolutely love this guy. You know, this guy was my little brother. I love him to death. One of the best special team players that probably ever played in the game. A, a guy he's always going to be on the list. All-time Charger, one of the all-time Chargers. Great. A great special team guy. Needs no introduction. Kasim, I am Osgood. What's up, my brother from another mother? Gentlemen, thank you for having me on. Appreciate the time. Kasim, man, we, uh, we're, we're very excited to have you on the show, my man. Plenty to discuss, but it's, uh, man... We're excited to have you. I know Zoe was talking about getting you on. And I remember when I was a younger lad watching you make some big plays in the special teams back in the day. So it's uh, good to finally put faces to names, my man. And I think, you know, today, Zoe and I just want to, you know, get an understanding of, you know, the, the importance of special teams. You know, I think we get so infatuated with skilled players, running backs, wide receivers, but we kind of lose focus. You know, kind of in today's generation, we see the Matthew Slaters of the world, right, in New England. So I kind of want to go back to the early, early stages of your career, like even before we get into the special teams. You, know, you were a guy who played at FCS, right? And then you go to SDSU, and you were always kind of that guy in college, right? You were always, you know, top 10 in touchdowns, receiving yards, and then you just get undrafted, right? So going kind of from that point of just being that leader and that guy in college to being undrafted, was that kind of a humbling experience or kind of how did that prepare you to get into the league before we even talk about kind of the special teams notion of things. So you want me to give you the, the 30 minute uh, sitcom version of it, or you want the, the two hour long opening for a uh, law case? Uh, let's, do the, let's, do, let's do the eight hour. Let's, let's do the eight hour version. Grab eight your popcorn, hour. folks. <laughs> okay, well, once upon a time, there was a man named Lorenzo LeVon Neal, <laughs> number 41 in your parts. Hey, he, uh, Lolo was uh, one of my uh, mentors my, my first year in the league. And um, when, I got, when I went undrafted, it's humbling because you expect, you know, you have this whole vision of how your draft day is going to go and what you're going to do when you get to the NFL. And the NFL is really good at letting you know that you're not in charge. So you just got to fall in line. I learned this early on in my career when I, when I got there. There was a lot of uh, great veterans. Uh, Lorenzo Neal was one of the veterans that kind of told me, he said, look, you find out how you fit on special teams and you go out there and do it, right? Everybody here is good. Everybody's the man. Everybody was the man in college, but now you're in the NFL, so everybody's here. So how it goes is the pecking order. You know, there's draft picks, there's, there's politics, people that get paid, they got to get their show, they got to get their playing time. So you got to find out what's going to make you stick here. And not only you have a good personality, but you got to be uh, useful so that they make it hard for them to cut you. And Kasim, so, with, with, with that being said, Kasim, so, you know, some of the listeners, you know, they, you know, they see a lot of these guys get drafted and they're, they're college, they're, everyone loved them in college and like, oh my God, I've got my guy. And they know what they did in college. When you take us through, like Gordon was saying, when you take us through the college process, when you're, you're, you're getting ready to get drafted or whether you're undrafted, whatever it may be. I got drafted fourth round, didn't think, you know, thought I was going to get drafted second, thought I was going to draft it higher, and it didn't happen. But tell us kind of that process, going from in college saying, okay, do I have a chance? Do I have a chance to plan on Sundays? Before we get into the nitty-gritty, like you said, of special teams, because we can talk about special teams, but I want to know, when it, when you were in college, the yards, the things that you had, and you were looking at this from a distance, did you think you had a chance? What was that process like? Uh, I always knew going to a, a smaller school that wasn't one of the top uh, divisions like SEC or Pac-12, I knew there was going to be an uphill battle. And plus, I had transferred late in my career, so I missed my junior year. So I knew I was behind the eight ball. So I came out that senior year guns blazing. I knew that I had to go all out just to be, even get on the radar. And uh, fortunately, um, with going to San Diego State, it's like wide receiver university. So we we're putting up Madden numbers, and uh, it was it was a great experience. I knew that uh, that would give me a shot to at least go have a tryout on a team. So I always kept my perspective correct. I didn't know I didn't assume that I was going to go first round, you know, be this you know high paid guy coming out the woodwork. I knew I would have to be able to earn my spot on the team and you know solidify it by doing whatever whatever I need to do to to make the team. So was I played special teams. Was there any? Was there? Any, did you play special teams in college? One. And two, were there any other NFL teams that you were going to get a tryout with? There was any other teams on your slate that you said, hey, uh, I need to play here. Tell us what and what, how that process was. Yeah, I played special teams early on in my college career. Um, they had me on defense at first. Uh, I was just an angry kid in high school. I was trying to hit people <laughs> in practice. So they saw the defense in me. But 
uh, we had some injuries on offense. So I switched back over to offense uh, my sophomore year in college and became All-American that year. And then, you know, the rest for that part. But I always had this love for special teams because that's where I started out. And I always wanted to do it when I went to San Diego State, but we didn't have the numbers, so I wasn't able to do it there. But I kept it in the back of my mind to know that once I get to NFL, I'd have to do that because, you know, there's only so many uh, starting positions and there's only so many uh, plays in a game. And the best way to maximize your exposure is to get on special teams, and that way you're active every week. Because it's, no it's important to be active every week in order to even get a chance to be put in there on offense. So, uh, no I mean, yeah, go, going undrafted that, uh, that day, I knew that I would come uh, to San Diego. One, because I spoke to James Lofton. Uh, I knew some of the guys on the team already. Um, my cousin, Wade White, was uh, really good friends with uh, Lorenzo growing up. So kind of had some ends with some people. And uh, I was fortunate to have Lorenzo there. And I actually had a locker room locker right next to Lolo. Uh, he used to make me uh, clean his uh, gym bag uh, every day too. So it was <laughs> a lot of hazing, a lot of hazing that went on. And uh, rookie duties. <laughs> yeah, but no, no, no. All jokes aside, uh, Lorenzo was a very smart veteran, and I knew that right on. I already knew his resume of what he br brought to the table. I watched him. He was uh, a fullback in the NFL, and as you know, they phased out special teams players. They phased out foot fullbacks. They changed the whole dynamics of how we play the game. No but back then, he was like a sledgehammer, and I was like a pickaxe. You know, I would sit there and watch him grind daily, you know, not get the credit, but do all the work, go out there, put his body on the line, uh, sacrifice. And I, I kind of just wanted to emulate that. And I used to pick his brain. How do you do this? How do you do that? Whether it was on the field or off the field, just how to be a professional is not something that you know automatically. It comes with experience. So the best way to gain experience is to get around people that have experience. That's and I was fortunate point. to have some, some, some good veterans that would kind of show me the way. Um, more, more often than not, you, you assume that the veterans don't want to help the rookies because the rookies are eventually going to take their position. But me and Lorenzo were never in contention for any position, so I was able to pick his brain and get a, a wealth of knowledge that benefited me for the rest of my career. That's such a good point, Kasim, because you talk about you know how you were the pickaxe, he was a sledgehammer, and you just or whatever, and you saw him, whatever, vice versa. You just saw him grind every day, all the time. And you said, although you guys didn't play different positions, that that sounds like that kind of lit the fire under you in the special teams, right? You may not get noticed as much, but the coaches notice you, the team notices you, and that's all yeah. really what matters, right? It's not important as much as fans and at the time media not as prevalent to be noticing you as long as your guys in that locker room were. And obviously, we saw that payoff. Speaking of special teams, Lorenzo, this is brought to you by BetOnline.ag. We got two special teams. <laughs> Going on game one in the NBA Finals tomorrow night, Boston Celtics, Golden State Warriors. I want to ask you two real quick. Shout out to our sponsor, Bet Online. Who do you guys got in the series? Who do you guys got in the series? Come on now. I need Let's Golden State. I need Golden State. You, you, you know what? I want Golden State. I just think Boston's too long. I think when you look, look at the way they play defense, I think it's going to be a very good matchup. If you think about the series right now, I think Boston's up nine to six far as just head-to-head -head competition this is going to be a great test a great measuring great stick i think it's going to be a phenomenal series one of the best nba finals we've seen because something about golden state it's hard to bet against a champion they've been there but i'm gonna tell you boston's been battle tested in this playoffs in these playoffs boston has been battle tested so i, I can't wait to see these guys get it on but if you can't get along because him you might as well get it on right? get it on yep <laughs> hey i came here i came here to kick ass and chew bubble gum and i'm fresh out of bubble gum <laughs> <laughs> love it it's really easy to get started to all you listeners head to the website use your mobile device to sign up and use our promo code believe to receive 50 percent off welcome bonus on your first deposit Kasim, i do want to ask you listen it's special teams is, is it's obviously the game of football is very aggressive but special teams really highlights putting your body on the line, doing it whatever it takes, whether you're a turner, whether you're a gunner. So, you know, I wanted to ask you, how are you able to stay healthy? You know, for the most part in your career, I'm looking at your games played. I'm seeing a lot of 16s, a lot of 16s, the lowest being 12. So was there anything specific that you did, especially being a dominant presence on the special team side of the ball to stay healthy? When you would initiate contact, would you do things differently than other people just to preserve your body, just to buy those extra times to really give you that longevity? As Lorenzo says, you played a lot of seasons in the league, man, 12 to be exact. So how were you able to do that, specifically being in such an aggressive teams unit? So, so there's this there's this workout program. It's called the the, the no neck Lorenzo Neal program, where you strengthen your neck so much that it disappears, and you're able to get really really strong in the head and shoulder area. And that's what you use to battering ram on all the old school. We used to have a wedge, like a four man wedge back in the day, sometimes five. But uh, I mean, the the game has evolved. You know, the the minute Will Smith slapped Chris Rock, I mean, the minute Will Smith started that movie Concussion, he brought a lot of light. He brought a lot of light to the the damages that happened in the NFL, and we all knew that it was there. You know, you see guys after they're done their career, they kind of 
you know, uh, devolve. But uh, stretch teams is very crazy. You have to be half insane and half stupid to be able to do it. And you go down there, you throw your body on the line, but it was all for the benefit of the team. Uh, I was a team guy. I, I love to see guys like Lorenzo O'Neal and LT push the ball in after we get a long kickoff return. So, so my whole goal was they were not calling uh, Lorenzo O'Neal to score the touchdown more than they were calling LT. And it's just, you know, the nature of the business. So my job was to try to get us a kick return down to the two-yard line. So they had to call Lorenzo O'Neal to go through the middle. <laughs> so it was more like, you know, hey, I'm going to help you. You help me. But um, hey, no, what, all jokes aside, though, it was just, uh, you know, you have to go out there. You have to be crazy, reckless. Uh, it's all for the team. And that's how you make your bread and butter. So, I mean, 100%. for me, it was excitement. I, I'm more like a stuntman in Hollywood. So anytime I get a chance to go out there and make a, a dazzling play and it benefits the team, then I'm all for it. And special teams is usually for younger mm -hmm. players. They don't keep a lot of those guys because they know every year the young players, first, second round, third round guys, they're going to play a lot of special teams, and then they're going to grow on this. And it's a recycle of that. So how many people last? It, it's, it's for you to be able to last as long as you did. You know, the listeners, when you look at the Chargers now, when you think about how many block punts they allowed, you know, they went out and got an edge rusher. And, you know, in, in, in Tyler, you know, you know, defensive end, but he plays a lot of special teams. There's still that niche. What is some of the things that you look for? What is some of the things that you look for for a good special teams player? Because Sam, you think this is uh, going to give the Chargers, and not just the Chargers, but just the special teams community, uh, guys to look for? Well, I, I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Hamza Abdullah and uh, Matt Ware. you two guys that played for the Denver Broncos. We, we played against some, uh, I think you might remember them. But uh, they reminded me that when they played the Chargers, their number one concern was stopping myself and Henning Milligan. And I said, what was the thing that the coach told you guys to do? They said, look, these guys are angry. They're pissed off. They're very big. They were stars in college, and now they're not stars on the team. So all that energy they had as stars in college, they're putting it towards special teams. So you better match that, or it's going to be lights out for y'all. And for, for me, I look for guys that are hungry, that were, were the, the, the man in college that – Otherwise, fell through the cracks. Those guys that fall through the cracks, they have a chip on the shoulder. They're coming out hungry. They're guns blazing. They need to make a name for themselves to prove the, the people wrong, the critics wrong. So any of the guys that, that have that strength, that have the smarts, uh, good team guys, how are they in the community? Did they get a lot of community service? How are the grades? Uh, all these things play into effect when you're drafting a guy or putting a guy on your team to say, is this guy a team guy or is he a selfish guy? Is he a me, me, me? Is he going to complain about not being the starter? You have to find guys that are saying, you know what, it's not about me, it's about the team. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to show them that I can contribute in any way possible in order to make the team better. And then you go from there. So I'm looking for guys that are smart, hungry, and just pissed off. Kasim, take, take me in your head when you, you know, coming out of San Diego State. And what was that moment? I know you talked about Lorenzo being a good mentor and understanding that, you know, you're going to have to contribute in other ways. But You'd be lying. I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, I'm sure you wanted to play receiver at first when you come into the National Football League, like just out of anybody. We're human beings. It's nature. I want to catch touchdowns. I want to be in front of the cameras. Like that's the nature of sport. It's the nature of being a human being. What was that turning point where you accepted your identity, you accepted your role? And you accepted your understanding that you're going to be the best ever in that role. Because it sometimes takes time, especially for younger guys, to accept that, you know, listen, I'm going to make my bread and butter. I'm going to make my guap doing some other things, and I'm going to be the best at that and the best I can be, which you clearly were. But when was that mental transition and that mental acceptance? Do you remember in uh, Avengers, uh, Avengers, I think it was eight, uh, End, Endgame, when the Hulk said, that's my secret. I'm always mad. Uh, I never I never accepted it. I, always, I never allowed somebody to label me and tell me what I, I could that. and couldn't do when I, I knew that. in my own heart that I could do it. What I did was I took all that, that rage and that, that energy and I put it towards bettering the team rather than trying to get it for selfish gain. Because there was a time when I was starting. Uh, we had injuries early on in our career. David Boston yep. went down. Um, yep. Lolo remembers right. this. I had a 100-yard game in Pittsburgh. And I was starting. But when I tore my uh, pec tendon playing the uh, Raiders, I lost my starting position to another first-round draft pick in Vince Jackson. You know, God rest his soul. Um, so when, when Vince Jackson came on the scene, he was the man. He was the starter. He was draft pick. They got to get him in there. So politics dictate that I need to find another way to contribute or probably either get shuffled to another team or not have a job anymore. So for, for me, it's always been a matter of, you know, I accept the fact that they won't let me do what I, what I know I can do, but I'm always going to be ready to do it when they call my number. So just being in the playbook, being able to have more value than just a special player. Hey, he's also a third round, uh, third uh, receiver or a fourth receiver. And he can get in there in certain packages and contribute. So you have a double-edged sword 
where you can get out there and still contribute, but also do special things because that's what the team needs you to do. And that's true, Borna. That's one thing I can say about Kassim. He played with that chip on his shoulder, and he always said, man, I should be playing. I should want to be playing more. And that's kind of when you look at the guys in the special teams role around the league. You look around, look at the Chargers. Look at every – look how many games that could have been lost for field position against the Raiders, field position, certain things that happened in certain, certain games that – could have won games. Field position always says, you know, offense counts as a third, defense counts as a third, and special teams counts as a third. And you look at going into this year, this year, this team, you look at what they did on defense, going out and getting Khalil Mack, going out and making different what they did in the offensive tackle, grabbing different guys. Look what they did getting running back. So you went out and you said, you're going to get better on offense and defense, going out and getting some um, veteran players to play some special teams. But special teams is so critical, even now I know it's different with the kickoff and you know where it is and how but you watch field goal. I remember the big game last year, Green Bay and the Cincinnati Bengals came down to field goal. Both of field goal goods. One team missed three field goals, the other one missed four. But special teams in field position, let's talk about that to said how important for the Chargers team this year, field position and what can special teams do for this team with the talent that they have. Uh, special teams is like a pressure release valve. So you're in a tight game with another another equally matched opponent. Every yard, if, uh, Marty Schottenheimer says the hidden yardage in special teams that wins games. So if you have a, a lights out quarterback like uh, Sherbert, I love Rainbow Sherbert. The guy's a phenomenal guy. <laughs> and put him in a situation where he can dominate in the red zone every time and not have to march the whole field. You keep him healthy. You keep your O line fresh. You go in there, you're scoring games, you put your kickoff team out there, you're pinning guys back on the five-yard line. He's yeah. talking about field position, how important field position is, especially in a big game, Borna, when you think about the Chargers. And when you have electrifying offense, now instead of them having to drive 80 yards down the field, have something where they're across midfield, and now the offense can even be more potent. potent. And now you're looking at defense, and that's what's big. And I think the Sims back, but the Sims talk about how big it was from fourth down when we punt the ball. And you guys, you had a, a, a kicker in Mike Cyphers at the time, but how field position, what you were able to do at the gunner. So explain to the audience, how important are those parts of the game? Oh, man. I mean, Mike Cyphers was a deadly weapon that was oh, man. severely underrated. This man could kick a pass to me, and I say kick a pass to me on the one-yard line. We're playing Dallas Cowboys. I downed four punts on the one-yard line in one game. And they're starting out, the other offense starting out their one-yard their one line every time. There's no way you're going to win a game like that. I mean, you got my Cypress punting 80-yard punts, uh, getting us out of bad field position. You got gunners like myself and Henning Milligan running down there with double coverage, taking those guys out and getting the punter stop, a punt return stop with only a four-yard turn. I mean, field position swings like that set your guys up like Sean Merriman and Sean Phillips to come off the edges in, in third and long positions and get sacks. I mean, this is, it's never-ending, the scenarios that you can run. You got a guy like Darren Sproles that gets the punt and can get 80 yards in one spot. And then you got LT and Lorenzo on the two-yard line punching it in. You're winning games like that. That's, that's championship football right there because that's all three phases working in harmony in order to achieve a common goal. That's a Without point. And with that being said, Bonner, that's that situation where you're on first of your, your, your defense now is holding that offense and they get yeah. the ball and starting to yeah. drive on a two-yard line. You can't go step step drunk. It takes a week to have pass rushes now. The quarterback doesn't want to go seven-step drop. The offensive coordinator is saying, we can't go seven-step drop, so what are you going to do? You're going to run on first and second down. You're going to try to get quick ball out of the hands because you don't want to give up the safety. So now, and also, if you can, if you're able to hold them down there, now the punter, he doesn't get his full 12 yards or 10 yards. Now he's got to be on the goal line, so he's got to shorten his punt, shorten his step. So there's so many things that that leads to. So I just want to know, I mean, I just know how important special teams were. And I think this year with the Chargers, Bona, you know where, where they're at. You can tell this team is poised to compete and compete for a Super Bowl this year. Special teams, to me, is going to be the deciding factor if this team is to get in the playoffs and to do damage. Absolutely. I think they drafted well. I think they drafted well with the players they have now and the veterans they added to the team. And I think special teams is always going to give everybody that competitive advantage to do what they do best. No, and, and, to, and to be quite frank, I mean, the special teams with the Chargers, it just hasn't been good enough the last half decade or so. And, and, you, and you've seen it really damage the team. And I, I like how the team's investing in it now, knowing that you have this superstar quarterback. I mean, even getting Dustin Hopkins last year, the dude was absolute money. The biggest sign I like, Lorenzo, is DeAndre Carter. You know, really good kick returner from 
uh, Washington oh, yeah. last year, returned some for touchdowns. They just need that spark. There was an issue where we just couldn't find that kick returner for years and years. And listen, this kind of segues into one thing too, Kasim. You know, we talk about these kick returners, but now today in football, we're seeing mostly touchbacks here and there. It seems like with all these rule changes to kickoffs, right, with almost everything ending up as touchbacks, do you feel that the, the era of a special team's ace, you know, someone like yourself, someone like a Matthew Slater in New England, do you feel that era, that era is coming to an end? What are your thoughts on that? Just because they're trying to, basically they're trying to strip kickoff returns, punt returns from the game. I literally said this the other day to one of my friends. I said, Matthew Slater is the last of a dying breed. He's yeah. like the last of uh, our, our brotherhood of, of special team players. I mean, they, they're kind of limiting that, you know, based off of player safety. It's kind of a hard argument to have because on one side, you want to be safe. You want to make sure guys are healthy and continue their, their lives after football. But on the other side, it's an entertainment sport. It's a gladiator sport. And you want to have those big hits and collisions because that's a, a tone setter for your team. And you're taking away the ability for a team that's action packed on special teams or have a lot of depth on special teams to go out there and make a difference in the game. So it's, it's kind of even the playing field for some of the guys that don't really draft well for special teams. But at the same time, if you can find your little ways that you can get like a blue kick and pin somebody inside the 20 and, and force them to return it, you can start seeing uh, the evolution of the game in that aspect. And people are going to start trying to play strategically in order to get the, the defense a better starting position. Well, I think bigger with me, Bona, I think that now since the cat's out of the bag and we understand concussions and all those different things are here, I, I think that now since it's there and I think you got to still take care of the players, the biggest thing is the NFL has to do is acknowledge that these things we know that can cause concussions and brain damage all those different things but guys sign up for we sign up for it now there's millions of dollars there from lawsuits that these, these nfl you, you, the nfl can give these guys afterwards but knowing if they can just do a better job of taking care of these guys with insurances and things afterwards i think that's the biggest deal we know cigarettes kill we understand cigarettes cause cancer but people are still going to smoke we understand what football can do, the trauma and the things it can cause, but people, people are still going to want to play this game. Because why? Because we're a grown man playing a kid's game, getting a king's ransom. And I don't think that was spot, but I do think that you can protect these players. But with that being said, you still got to let this game be football. It's still a contact sport. Yes, there's things you can put in for business, but this is still a grown man sport, and you got to be ready to be able to understand, work out, do the things you can to protect yourself. And, and you know, it makes a good point that you know safety is, is a big part of it but it's also a gladiator sport right like it's the player's decision to put your body on the line and you know he says it's a tone set this is my prediction my bold prediction is a team from the afc west will win the super bowl there will be three there will be three teams make the playoffs in the afc west this is the toughest division in football so there's going to be one team maybe left out and i'm going to tell you right now this this division is nails. You have no question the best quarterbacks in this division by far. Think about who you have. You have Mahomes. You have you know, as you said, Kasim Sherbert. You have, you have Russell Wilson. You have Derek Carr. You have you have four quarterbacks that are all Pro Bowl type of quarterbacks. You have you, you can look at this and it's interesting to say, but isn't it safe to say that you know that if if life continues and these quarterbacks play the way that they're playing there may be three out of the four go to the hall of fame one day think about that in one conference bro. three yeah. out of four not bad and the fourth one that may not go in car is not so bad either got into the playoffs and when you look at it now they might have played they might have played the cincinnati Bengals the best out of the afc in the Definitely. playoffs when you look at that yeah true very true and and and, and now they're adding Devonte adams to the fold just the best receiver in the national football league right, so it's right. gonna be a. <laughs> Man, it's going to be a hell of a division. I mean, Hunter Renfro was already a Swiss Army knife on his own. Now he's not going to be even double covered anymore. Imagine this right. guy playing single coverage in the slot. So it's going to be, man, there's going to be eight amazing games. Excuse me, seven in the division. And, hey, we got a lot of primetime games this year. Schedule coming out. We're on Sunday night, Monday night. So it should be a hell of a season. I, I got our bolts in the playoffs as well. You know, I don't like to make predictions after that because I feel like once you get in the dance, anything can happen, right? No question. So, yeah, no question. Okay, it's, it's going to be a hell of a ride. But uh, listen, Kassim, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you got to get your little right hook going shortly. So uh, oh, yeah, you take you a little time. time. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. got it. We'll, we'll do it again later during the season. Kassim, love to get you back on when the playoff, when, when the game, when the season starts. And maybe we'll do this prediction again halfway. And let us know what you think about the special teams and who's going to start to stick out. So thanks for your time. We're excited about having you on next again too soon, Tim. Oh yeah, always available. Take care, everybody.